In the Bible, incense is a type of prayer. Revelation 5, 8. As incense goes up, so our prayers fill the temple. The prayers of the saints is the incense, the sweet incense. It's a day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Let my incense arise. Let my prayers arise. Oh, day and night, praise the Lord. The Bible said, and everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. He said, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. And then he tells us what to think about. You know, God has helped us and does help us every step of the way. He says in Isaiah 41, 13, he said, I'll, I'll hold your hand. Praise God. Amen. You thought that was a Beatles song. I want to hold your hand. God said, I want to hold your hand thousands of years ago. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's get our Bibles out. Thank you, Father. Oh, blessed be the Lord. Father, we give you praise for your precious spirit. We give you praise for everything that you're doing in our lives, doing in the earth. We give you praise, God, because you are worthy of our praise. We thank you, Lord, that you can cause us to think your thoughts. You can cause us. To walk in your ways, you can cause us, God, by the outpouring of your spirit, you can cause us, Father, to know the mind of God. Hallelujah. Colossians 1 says, be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you may walk. Somebody said, can I walk worthy of the Lord? He said, yeah. He said, uh, you can be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Wow. Isn't that beautiful? Some people think, oh, I'll never be pleasing to God. Unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with might according to His glorious power. Now watch this. Unto all patience. Somebody said, I, I need patience. Well, praise God, it's right there. When you're filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, unto all patience. Now watch it. He didn't stop there. Unto all patience and long suffering." Those are two of the hardest words in all of the human language. Everybody say patience, long-suffering. But check this out. He said you can do it with joyfulness. Now that separates the gospel from the non-gospel. That separates the word from your thoughts. You say, well, Lord, how is it possible to have patience and long-suffering with joyfulness? Well, you hang around Jesus, you'll get it. Amen. You hang around the Holy Spirit, you'll get it. We're talking about the prayer impression. The prayer impression. The central truth is to have God's impression on our prayer lives is to pray effective, fervent prayers that make tremendous power available, dynamic in its working in the daily lives of believers. Let me ask you a question. PG&E, the Pacific Gas and Electric Company, puts out... Uh, warnings every time there's a storm and those warnings uh, include do not go near a fallen electric wire don't go near it even if it looks dead don't touch it why it'll kill you it's got so much electricity it can just fry you so they say stay away from it well prayer is like that why do you think the devil works overtime to get people's prayer lives all messed up because he knows it's powerful he knows that if you get it right, your days of worrying are over. And your days of going up and down, up and down are over. Why? Because prayer, the effectual fervent prayer of righteous men and women avail much. James 5.16. To review our notes, to be impressed is to receive a telling image on the senses, mind, or heart. Particularly the heart. To receive a telling image on the inside of your heart that affects or alters us to the image of God in Christ Jesus. That's what we talk about when we say an impression. And whatever happens to us that changes us 
should conform us to the image of Jesus. Doesn't matter, because that's the goal in life, is to be conformed to His image. To be impressionable is to be prepared to be impressed. Now, we started this year by talking about prepare to be impressed. Every day you can prepare yourself to be impressed by God. God, we read in Exodus 31, verse 18, And God gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. Now, now you see, Moses was communing with God. How many of you want to commune with God? That's, that's fellowship. But you can't commune with God without being changed. Not if you're communing properly. I mean, you can make up a, a conversation about God and just carry on, and people have. But the God of glory is not going to leave you unglorified. He said, the glory I received, I give to you, John 17, in his priestly prayer. So he writes with his finger the tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments. But in 2 Corinthians 3.3, 3, he said, You are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink. Aren't you glad God's not writing with ink? He's not writing on tablets of stone, but with the Spirit of the living God. Woo! Not with tablets of stone, but with fleshly tablets of the heart. God is going to, you know, your heart, the hidden. Paul called it the hidden man of the heart. He's not talking about your blood pump. He's not talking about a physical thing. He's talking about your inner man. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. What does that mean? That God's going to use your, if we did it in modern day English, we'd say the spirit of man is the flashlight of the Lord. God's going to use your spirit to turn the flashlight on. He's going to talk to you spirit to spirit. You know, somebody said, I felt God. Well, good for you. But God's not a feeling, is he? Any more than I, I can say I feel Sherry. She's not a feeling. She's a person. In case I forget, I wear one of these. Amen. Sometimes you don't feel Mary. Sometimes I have to check myself. I have two kids. I got two kids. I don't feel those kids. They're grown up and they're moved away. Now, it doesn't happen very often because I'm conscious of them all the time. But you could think in your mind, do I have kids? I don't feel them. Right? Are you here? Don't, now, don't look at me in that tone of voice. <laughs> Praise the Lord. What I'm saying, though, it's not based on a feeling. Love is not based on a feeling. If love is based on a feeling, uh, you'd be up and down like an elevator. 154 stories. <laughs> you'd just be up and down, up and down, up and down. Because your body doesn't know what to do with itself. It's like, a, it's like 15 kindergarten kids. If you don't know what to do with them, they don't know what to do with themselves. But guess what? They'll find something to do, and it'll all be 15 different directions. So you got to have a plan if you're going to have 15 kindergarten. Amen? Well, when you wake up in the morning, you got to get up before the devil. That's, that's the way God put it to me. And so let's look at Jesus. He's going to write these things on our heart. God's not writing on tablets of stone. He's writing on fleshly tablets of the heart. And he's writing with his spirit, not with his finger. These scriptures that we put in your bulletin, we're going to read them again, the prayer life of Jesus. We're just going to read them, and you'll get the gestalt of it. I want you to hear and visualize yourself walking with Jesus and praying with him. Matthew 14, 23. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. I said this before, that who has, a, who has a, a, an incredible meeting of all kinds of people, and immediately goes to pray afterwards. No, you, you go ahead, eat, you have a party, you celebrate the time you had, but no, Jesus went to be alone and pray. Luke 6, 12, it was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray, and he spent the whole night in prayer unto God. Mark 1, 35, and early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. Hallelujah. Luke 5, 15 and 16. However, the report went around concerning him all the more, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. The concept version says, so he would often slip away in the wilderness to pray. 
Matthew 25, 36, 39, 42, 44. Sounds like a football game. Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. Now, Jesus knew where he was going. And he went over there to pray. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me yet, not as I will, but as you will. Now, you got to remember, this is not Jesus in a prayer posture. He's crying out. This is desperation. But his desperation is focused on his father. And that's where our desperation, if we are feeling that way, should be focused on our father. Amen. Verse 42, he went away again a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. Verse 44, he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Just as a footnote, remember this, okay? The prayer of consecration and dedication can be prayed again and again. Prayer of faith, you don't keep praying it over and over. Once you pray it, it's prayed. Why? Because the prayer of faith knows the promise of God and it knows what you're supposed to do. There's a promise. You're either standing on a promise or you're, you're reaching for the promise. You know what God wants to do. And, uh, and sometimes it takes prayer to find out what he wants to do and find a promise. But if it's a direction that you're seeking, that's when you pray, not my will, but yours be done. If you're praying for healing, you don't pray, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus bore our sicknesses and carried our diseases. Why would he bear them if he didn't want to heal us? I said, why would he bear them if he didn't want to heal us? Technically, if you want to get covenant about it, you were healed 2,000 years ago. A friend of ours, I love him, is Fred Ireland, still know him. We were teaching on this subject many years ago. He said, I was healed a long time ago because of Jesus. Now I know it's been manifested I'm feeling fine. Praise the Lord. Healing is mine. Now, that's so simple a song. You could, you could just sing that all day. But it ministers to the heart the truth of redemption, doesn't it? All right, Mark 14, 32, 35, 39. Huh? They came to a place called Gethsemane. This is just Mark's look at it. And he said unto his disciples, sit here until I have prayed. And he went a little beyond them and fell to the ground. And he began to pray as as if it were possible that the hour might pass by him. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. Luke 11, 1. Luke chapter 11, verse 1. It happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. Now, that's a very interesting thought, because Jesus' disciples said, teach us to pray. Why did he think they said that? They watched him pray. They knew he was a man of prayer. He was the son of God. Jesus didn't need to pray. He'd just wake up and say, peace, be still. That's not true. He prayed to his father. Now, if Jesus prayed before he did anything else, I think we should do that. So, well, that's hard to do. I, I can't wake up that much. I, how many hours am I supposed to pray? Well, to be truthful about it, I love what Smith Wigglesworth, the great English preacher, said. I never pray more than 30 minutes. Never go 30 minutes without praying. You see, it's not how long you pray. And we always say this. You just got to write this down if you don't know it. Prayer does not make faith work. The more you pray, the more faith you're going to have. That, that's not necessarily true. But faith makes prayer work. The prayer of faith, not the faith of prayer. And, you know, Jesus said, don't be a hypocrite and pray in public so that people can see you. Some people's prayer lives are only what people can see. But Jesus was different, and the disciples knew it, so they said, teach us to pray. And the Bible is full of teaching on prayer. But what we're talking about mainly, we go to the prayer lab Saturday and, and get more into detail. But what we're praying about here is the prayer impression. What makes a man want to pray? What makes a woman want to pray? What makes you want to get up and pray before you eat food. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now listen to me very closely. Everybody look up here. Look at my eyes. Live your convictions and preach Christ. Now you may do certain things in your prayer life that are very, very unique to you. Praise the Lord. Amen. You might go up in a tree and pray. I don't know. 
I knew one fellow, John Osteen, Joel Osteen's father. He used to go out and sit under a tree with a cup of coffee. That's where he would pray. Well, you know, praise the Lord. It's fine if you have a nice tree <laughs> to go find one. But that's, that doesn't make it any holier if you sit under, you know, uh, under the bench and pray. Some of these things are very unique to yourself where you feel comfortable and so forth. That's not the secret of prayer. The secret of prayer is that you went and actually prayed. Hallelujah. All right. The prayer source we talked about in Press to Pray. We talked about in Leviticus 16, 12, that there are live coals. This was instructed in the Old Testament. I'm going to just do a little bit of review, and then we'll get to where we're going tonight. He took the live coals. What happened was there's a tabernacle in the wilderness. And when you went through the, the gate or the door to the tabernacle, you went through the tribe of Judah just outside of the tabernacle, which is you entered through praise and worship. That's the best way to start your day is through praise and worship. The prayer of praise and worship is one of the highest forms of faith. You, you go through the tribe of Judah and you enter in, and there's an altar of sacrifice because we can't approach a holy God without forgiveness of sin. And our sin has to be cleansed. Somebody say cleansed. And you don't get your sins cleansed by doing good works. You don't get your sins cleansed by trying to be a good boy or girl. You get your sins cleansed by going to the blood of the Lamb and allowing the blood to wash you. For sin comes death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Without the shedding of blood, the Bible said, there is no remission of sin. But thanks be to God, we're in the New Testament. Jesus shed his blood and paid for every single sin. Everybody say, he paid for my sins. Everyone. Jesus paid it all. Amen. So they would take the coals from that altar of sacrifice and they would go into past the labor of cleansing and they would go to the holy place. And on one of the sides is the altar of incense. And you have on a table, you have a lampstand and you have eight branches. And at the top is a bowl and you have a wick, and every day the priest would come in and trim the wicks and put fresh oil to burn. And that candlestick was a representation, really, of the church to come. Amen. Made of gold bespeaks, and that tells us of the divine nature. We're partakers of his divine nature. We escape the corruption that's in the world through strong desires. So when that candlestick is lit, it lights it up. Amen. And Jesus said to the church, you are the light of the world. He came as the light of the world, but now we are the light of the world. He said, candlestick's not put, you got to put it up on high on a mountain so people can see it. You don't put it under a bushel basket, isn't that right? So let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. It started with those hot coals off the altar of sacrifice. So where does the power to pray come from? Amen. It comes from the Lord. It doesn't come from you. Oh, I mean, I, I, honestly, when I first got saved, I started watching the 700 Club and the Pat Robertson and Ben Kinchlow was his sidekick at that time. I heard him. He exhorted people, take some time and just pray. And I said, well, I, nobody's ever said that to me yet. I've only been saved a couple of weeks. And he said, just, just try 10, 15 minutes. I thought 10, 15 minutes. I that seems like an eternity. I've never been a pr I've never prayed. I mean, I prayed, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, kingdom come, we will be done with give us there, 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 give us there, give us there. Amen. Let's get going. Hail Mary, full of grace, Lord, with thee, holy Mary, mother of God, there is no Amen. Oh my God, I'm heartily sorry for having offended thee, and I just often said, because I just went, Amen. Those are the three prayers that were on the rosary. I mean, you know, praise the Lord. Our Father, act of contrition, hail Mary. So you learn to pray those really fast. And so you could book. But in your mind, you said, I prayed five Our Fathers and two Hail Marys. And you know, I'm doing pretty good today. I haven't prayed those in a while. Woo, I feel like I'm, I'm walking in tall cotton. Woo. <laughs> so anyway, he, he exhorted us to pray and because I, I didn't have a first notion about what to do. I, I said, okay, I'm going to do that. But I didn't know what to do. I said, Lord, I love you. 
And uh, I thank you for saving me. And But then somebody told me, showed me some New Testament prayers. And I started praying those. And all of a sudden, my prayer life started expanding. Amen? What's really important is to understand the power comes from the Lord. And you say, Lord, I want to be a praying person. My pastor prays for me. The people at church are praying. And I want to contribute. Somebody say, contribute. The Bible talks about, in Ephesians 4, that we all are supplying joint. We're supplying joint. Your body is all supplying to the rest of the body, isn't it? Your body's working together to supply what you need. And if the hand says to the foot, I don't need you, and you know the scripture Paul talks about, the body needs each other, even the weakest part of the body, you don't want somebody to cut it off and just take, take it away. I don't use my little finger very much, Lord. Just go ahead, cut it off. I don't need it. You wouldn't do that. Nobody would do that. So you allow every joint to supply, don't you? So we want to be a supplying joint. I want to, I want to, I don't know, I didn't know everybody at our fellowship, but I wanted to start praying for them. I wanted to start praying for the world. I want to start praying. There's things Jesus said to pray for our leaders and things like that. But here's the here's the part I want you to get for for this purpose when you see jesus praying in these scriptures doesn't that wake you up a little bit doesn't that energize you to say you know that's my lord and my savior the bible says in the book of hebrews he ever lives to make intercession jesus didn't stop praying when he went to heaven he's still praying and he's praying for who yeah if i didn't know anybody else is praying for me i know jesus is I don't know about you. Jesus gets his prayers answered. It's not heaven's fault. He's praying for me. And then I get really blessed. I had a family that was praying for me. And then I had a church praying for me. And before I even went there, they were praying for me because they knew of my mom and they knew of my family. So this impression, God is not writing on tablets of stone anymore. He's writing with his spirit on our heart. Glory to God. I mean, God writing on your heart. You know, that's pretty powerful. That's a powerful impression. We said this Sunday, there are people that get tattoos. And when they go to the tattoo place, the, the person says, I need you to uh, just lay back or whatever. I don't depends on where you're getting a tattoo. I need you to sit down and relax. You know, this has to be done real fast. I got an appointment. I got to be out of here in 10 minutes. Well, excuse me, but. I, I'm not some kind of a cartoon artist. I take my job seriously. When you have some more time, come back here. All right, Josh? Because you, you can't tell that person to hurry up. He said, I'll tell you what. <laughs> if you don't care what it looks like, I'll hurry up. <laughs> I mean, you still got to pay the same amount of money, but, but I'll hurry up if you, you don't care what it looks like. But if you want it to look decent, you want it to look right, because I'm an artist. Well, the Heavenly Father is the greatest artist ever. Anybody, Michelangelo, anybody that's ever painted anything got their gift from heaven. They didn't get it because they're a superstar. Whatever you got, you got from heaven. It's a gift. I knew you in your mother's womb. Praise the Lord. And so when, when you go to the Lord, you got to give him your time, your talent, your treasure, and you stand before God and you say, Lord, I'm ready to be impressed. I, I'm preparing myself to be impressed. Now in your notes, again, we're talking about the coals off the sacrifice. Under number two, prayer is a love word. And we talked about the love impression already. The greatest impression, the number one greatest impression you could ever be impressed with is the love of God. The number one greatest impression that could be impressed by the Spirit of the living God on your heart. The greatest tattoo you could ever wear on the inside. Nobody can see it, but you know it. You can't escape it. It's so it's so real, so strong, so alive, so beautiful, so wonder, wonderful. It's been burned into your consciousness that God is love. Everybody say it out loud. God is love. Say it again, please. Say it again. 
God has a lot of things, but He is love. He has power. He has gifts, but He is love. Amen. So this love word, look at Matthew 6.6. 6. This is very powerful. Jesus had a prayer impression. That's, that's what I wanted to say. Jesus had a prayer impression. That's why we could read those scriptures. He would get up before the sunrise. After a meeting, he would go by himself and pray. Why? He had given so much out. Jesus was always replenishing himself. He never found himself where he couldn't minister because he always went and replenished what he needed to replenish. Matthew 6, 6, he says, but when you pray, enter your closet. Closet could mean bedchamber. It could mean private place. One translation says, in a secluded place. A secluded place, all right? Just some place where you're not going to get bothered. Uh, shut your door. Everybody say, shut the door. That's the same as turn off the phone. Now, if you want to use your Bible on your phone, fine, but don't be texting people. That's, you know, get before your father. It'd be better to spend one minute with your father alone without any texting and stuff than spend 10 hours with him and, and be sidetracked the whole time. Again, it's not about how much. It's how much are you changed. See, that's the only thing that matters. You cannot spend any amount of time with the Heavenly Father without being changed. It's impossible. It's impossible. So, well, how do I know He's there? Well, praise God, if you've been saved, you have a witness in your spirit. You have a witness in your spirit that you belong to Him. Then if you just start following His Word, let me tell you something that really is a blessing. The moment you act on a Scripture, and you know you're acting on a Scripture, you got it. There's no going back. Because faith is an act. When you read something and it pops off the page, and it will. I've told people this many times. The book of John is probably the greatest revelation of Jesus. If you've never read the Bible, start with the book of John and just read it. And something's going to jump off the page at you. And that's where faith will begin. And you'll begin to act on that scripture. And that'll be your scripture. How many of you ever heard somebody quote a scripture? And you say, well, wait a second, that's my scripture. Like, what are you doing? What are you doing with that scripture? That, that one's mine. God spoke to me. <laughs> Hallelujah. When you enter your closet, shut your door. Pray to your father, which is in secret. And your father, which sees in secret, shall reward you openly. <laughs> I remember... Before I got saved, I was working in Hunt's Cannery in Hayward. And I, and I, I asked my mom. It's the only prayer request I ever asked my mom. When they were having prayer meetings in our house. There, I said, pray that I get out of this place where they put me. Because they're all little Italian ladies. And they all come in there seasonally. Well, I just needed some cash in my pocket. And I'm standing there. I look like a giant. And they're just they're funny little ladies. And they're just... But there was one guy in there that, I don't know, he was after me. And I was after him. And I just said, I got to get out of here. Because they were going to get mad at me and they were going to punish me and stuff like that. I, said, I just got to get, this, this scenario does not work for me. So I asked my mom to pray and nothing happened. And I thought, well, I guess prayer doesn't work. And then out of the blue, something happened. I got the easiest job in the world. So, I, you know, it made an impression on me. My mom's prayer got answered. But you see, that was not an impression so much on my heart. But when I got saved, God began to impress my heart because I started reading the Bible. And those things got revealed. So he says, enter uh, into a quiet, secluded place. That's what the message says. Enter into a quiet, secluded place. Shut your door, just you and the Father. That's the thought, you and the Father. Remember, Moses communed with God. And he, and he wrote those tablets of stone when God was through communing with Moses. Well, God wants to commune with you. We will be changed in this place. Remember Revelation 3.20. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open the door, who's going to open the door? That's up to us to open the door. Jesus is knocking and he's saying, If any man will open the door, I will come into him and sup with him, and he will sup with me. That's beautiful communion. You can't ask for a better relationship. The CEO of heaven wants to communicate with you. 
<laughs> the covenant enforcing officer. Man, there you go. Hallelujah. Jude 20 says, But you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Why is it so important to pray in the Holy Ghost? He said, keep yourself in the love of God. Here's my reasoning behind this. And that is, if your prayer life is not about love, you're missing the point. I know we have needs. Some needs are very pressing. But that's a relationship of love. It's just like marriage. Marriage can be about a lot of stuff. But it started with love. And when it started with love, you, make, you give your vows and you say, with this ring, I thee wed and forever and ever. I'll be with you. This is forever. What God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And all these things are there. It's a covenant of love. But 20 years down the road, it could be, you're going to lose the house. And we're going to die. Blah, blah, but this is going on. That's going on. Oh, blah, 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 blah. And pretty soon you forgot the whole reason you got married. Because now it's about finances. It's about legal things and blah, blah, blah. But you know what? It's very easy to go back. When you take communion, it's very easy to take things back to their very beginning. That's why you take communion often. <laughs> and you go back to that beautiful table of the Lord and you say, this is my body, which is broken for you. See, Jesus doesn't want us to ever leave the fact that he loves us. This is my body, which is broken for you. What is that? That's an act of love, isn't it? Come on, help me. Help me a little bit. It's an act of love. And you take the cup. This is the cup of the new and everlasting covenant. Woo! Hallelujah. You become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You become a king and a priest unto God. This is holy. This is holy ground you're standing on. Glory be to God. And when you take communion properly, he says, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. He's coming back. He's coming for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. What's that mean? That means he's going to perfect that which concerns us. This is a beautiful thing he's doing with his church. We have a privilege to be a part of this beautiful church. So 1 Corinthians 13 tells us if I don't have love, it doesn't profit me anything. So he tells us in the table of the Lord in 1 Corinthians 13, he's telling us it's all about love. So why wouldn't our prayer lives be all about love? God is love. And so here's the deal. Let's go to Philippians chapter 4. And I put in your notes here that the peace of God will overtake from here. The peace of God will overtake from here. Philippians 4 is probably, when I read this, I felt like the fire got turned up. There's some scriptures, if I didn't read them in the Bible, I would never think they would be in there. If somebody told me this scripture and said, where do you think this is? What writer do you think wrote this? I would think, well, I don't know. I didn't know anything like this could be in the Bible. But he said in Philippians 4, be careful for nothing. What would you do if you had a life that didn't have any cares? The word care means to be weighed down with anxiety, to be disquieted with apprehension. Cares are things that you were never, ever designed to carry. Now, if you had a pickup truck and a guy asked you to take a load of bricks to Tahoe, and the bricks were, let's just say, on two crates, stacked this high. And you said, well, how am I going to get those bricks up there? Well, you got a truck. I know, but I, I don't know. How am I going to get those bricks up there? The guy's going to pay me $1,000 to deliver them. I just got to drive them up there. And I don't want them to wreck my truck. How am I going to get those things up there? You spend all your time worrying about how you're going to get them up there. Well, that's why you have a truck. You load them on the truck. Hopefully you have a forklift to pick up the, the pallet. Thank you. I worked at a, a trucking company, pallet jack. And you put it up there and you're all taken care of. The truck was designed to carry the bricks. If you can't use your truck, find one you can use. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I knew a guy, he didn't want to get anything scratched in his truck. He never put anything in the back of his truck, ever. 
He just liked pickup trucks. But he wouldn't let, you couldn't even stand against his truck. Oh, no, he guarded that truck. They now have these fancy liners that are really cool. But <laughs> you can't see the beautiful truck, the, the bed anymore. <laughs> but underneath, he knows there's no scratches on it. But Christians are like that. You were designed to carry a care, and yet we carry them all the time. If you could see what that looked like in the spirit, it would look like the guy with the pickup truck carrying bricks to Tahoe himself. That's what it would look like. And you say, what is he doing? Right? You're not designed. So what do you do with these? Okay, Philippians 4. Be careful for nothing. So that means I have no cares. Take an inventory right now. Do you have any cares? Anxieties, worries, fretting, uneasy, can't rest, bothers me. What do you do with them? How do you get rid of them? This is how you get rid of them. He said, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer. You see, you don't have to enter a closet to do this. But if you start the day by entering a closet, taking a few moments alone with God, you'll be quick to respond. You'll identify a care instead of saying, oh, three hours later, oh, that's what I've been doing last three hours. I've been worrying. Oh, in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God, which, watch this, the peace of God, which passes or surpasses all understanding, you can't figure out why you're so peaceful. You have no physical reason to be at rest, but you're at rest. Why? Because there's this thing called God. There's this beautiful creator who invaded you when you gave him your cares. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, cast your care upon the Lord, for he cares for you. Now, if he didn't care for you, you couldn't cast them on him. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast your care. Throw all the weight of this anxiety. Cast it completely once and for all, once and forever on the Lord. The care doesn't belong to you. You have to cast it on the Lord. Everybody say, I cast my cares upon the Lord. I cast my care upon the Lord. Now, you can't regulate everybody tell them what to do you got to do this on your own you can remind somebody but you got to please yourself i'm telling you once you do this you're living the high life care doesn't belong to you now if you want to keep it that's up to you i mean you got a skunk sleeping in your bed and you don't get rid of it remember pharaoh the plague of the frogs yeah <laughs> When do you want me to mind? Oh, he said, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> Could have got him out that night, but he, he waited till tomorrow. But the peace of God, now watch this, we'll close with this. The shalom of heaven is where this beautiful relationship is working in perfect harmony. And things don't have to be perfect for it to be working. There's prayers that Sherry and I have prayed. We had no physical evidence of anything changing. And yet the peace of God overtook us, absolutely overtook us. We weren't trying to believe. We believed. We prayed. We cast our care. Now, I've had some days where I've had to cast a care 50 times. And I'm not kidding. 50 times in one day. But you know what? I'm just going to keep doing it. You keep lying to me. You keep throwing something at my head. I'm going to keep just, uh, I'm rubber, your glue. Whatever you say to me bounces off me and sticks on you. Ha ha, devil. Liar, liar, pants on fire. I caught you in a lie, Mr. Devil, and I'm just going to roll that care back on God. I know I roll it on God. Then I get some music, and I turn it up real loud. And I get the Bible on tape and turn that up real loud. I, whatever it takes, I'm going to exercise my faith until that care is gone. I'll give you a little secret here. If you pass that test, the next one's going to be easier. And the next one gets easier. And they get easier and easier. And pretty soon, you've passed so many tests, you're a straight-A student. <laughs> and people come to you and say, could you pray for me, please? Wow. I said, wow. Could you pray for me? 
Why would anybody ask me to pray for them? I'm just me. We're just Eddie and Sherry from Hayward. <laughs> but you know what? You get some victories and it feels good. But more importantly than that, you feel like you're working in the Father's vineyard. You're working in a beautiful place of harvest. You're working in a place where now you become dangerous. Listen to me. We're almost ready to close. You become dangerous to the powers of darkness. You are a threat wherever you go. That's powerful living. I said that's powerful living. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Wow. I've got something that's keeping my heart and mind through Christ Jesus. There is a fire that works on the inside of me, on the inside of you, on the inside of believers. There is an impression from heaven that draws you to this type of a prayer life where you begin to pray dangerous prayers. Amen. Let's pray. And let's believe God together. Let's put this into practice. Come on, let's stand up. And you at home can pray with us. <clears throat> you, Jesus. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we act on 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. that says, cast your cares upon the Lord. So let's do that right now. Just take every one of those cares. Just imagine every one of those cares in your hands right now. Just every one of them. I don't care what they are. Every single one of those cares. And, uh, and I want you to just go ahead and, and cast it on the Lord. And just let Him take them all. Amen. And don't, don't, you, don't you take them back. Amen. That care belongs to God now. Thank you, Jesus. He said, cast your cares upon the Lord, for He cares for you. Thank you, Lord. Everybody say, that's not my care. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Now, if you have a court date or something like that, that's still not your care. Now you say, well, I have to go stand before a judge. Well, that's where you ask God to give you wisdom. Ask God to intervene. You don't shrug, uh, shrug your responsibilities. You face them like you face a giant. But at that moment, you, you just have to ask God for wisdom. Ask God to help you. But that care does not belong to you. Care of your children doesn't belong to you. The care of your job doesn't belong to you. If somebody's trying to take away your house, that doesn't belong. That care doesn't belong to you. And don't fight people. The moment you fight a person, you've lost. Your battle's not with flesh and blood. It's principalities and powers. But now God has that care, okay? And we just, we just say, Father, thank you so much. You care for me. Lord, we uh, thank you so much. You care for me. Thank you, Jesus. I cast my care upon you because you care for me, Lord. You're working things out in, in the name of Jesus. You're working things out. You're healing my body. You're, you're changing my mind. You're changing my heart. You're changing and perfecting that which concerns me. And Lord, for those at home, those in the sanctuary right now, all of our cares are now on Jesus. And we are ready to be impressed with an impression from heaven that will not lie to us. The word, the promise of God will not lie to us. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we're open to your word. We're open to being led by your spirit. And we give you praise that if we walk carefree, praise God, if gum can be carefree, then people can be carefree. In the name of Jesus, we give you praise. Amen and amen. Do they still make that carefree gum? They do? You go, you go buy a little stick of carefree gum. Keep it with you to remind yourself, I'm not, I'm not taking any of these cares. If gum could be carefree, I could be carefree. Amen.